So yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and start with that. Um, so as a Haitian woman who was born and raised in the U.S., I've grown up with the knowledge that my ancestors fought against white supremacy, slavery, and colonization in one. So they created the first Black Republic and the only country to be founded on a successful slave revolt. So as the descendant of Haitian revolutionaries from both the Haitian Revolution and afterwards, I understand that my identity was only made possible through revolution and resistance and the unrelenting desire to live with dignity and freedom. So for me, fully understanding my own history means that I know that it's necessary to oppose all forms of oppression, including those based on white supremacy, capitalism, colonialism, and imperialism. And even though the details of my oppression and discrimination, both historically and currently, as a Black woman or as a Haitian or as a Black American, differ to the oppression that Palestinians face, I can still recognize that what Palestinians around the globe are experiencing and have experienced and what Black people around the globe are experiencing and have experienced are rooted in racism, colonization, and imperialism, and militarism. So in the U.S. context, um, you know, obviously these things have harmed Black Americans, but and indigenous people, but it also harms black and non-black people globally. So for example, the US has invaded, exploited, and occupied basically all of Latin America and the Caribbean at some point or currently um, in order to uphold right-wing US interests as well. And they've done the same in other regions around the world. Um, and in my home country of Haiti, the US is currently backing an authoritarian government. So it doesn't really make sense for me to see these different issues in the US and only oppose them in the US and not oppose them anywhere else. We have to recognize and oppose these issues wherever they appear. And um, you know, looking at racism and colonization in Palestine or the US, it becomes a sort of case study for how these evils manifest themselves. So these contexts show how colonization, capitalism, imperialism, and racism have sort of embodied themselves against black populations and against Palestinians. And when we realize that these ideologies are the issues that are at hand, we're able to apply our stances and our beliefs to different contexts all around the world. And I think that's what makes internationalism so powerful because we're able to connect these struggles against the same evils in different situations and show solidarity based on that. So, um, and then also when you study the details of this oppression, you notice how linked our struggles are, not only in the ideologies, but also in the exact practices that are used to oppress us. So um, Curry Peterson Smith, says in their essay in the book, Palestine, a Socialist Introduction, when entire societies, political and legal regimes are constructed over years to maintain the domination of a population, as is the case with these two in referring to the US and Israel, there's no such thing as coincidence. And that's the end of that quote. So some examples of this, since the 1990s and increasingly since 9-11, US law enforcement has been receiving training from Israel. So it's been the FBI, the police, immigration officials, just law enforcement in general. Um, and as of July 2020, more than 1,000 senior police officials from the U.S. visited um, or had visited the, um, Israel for training. So that doesn't mean that the U.S. somehow learned police oppression, I mean, police brutality or oppression from Israel. But what it does mean is that two institutionally and historically racist states founded on things like oppression, theft, colonization, and in the U.S.'s case, enslavement, are swapping tactics and ideas with each other. And of course, this um, has a lot of negative effects. This supports the trend in increasingly militarized policing tactics with the line between the police and the military blurring even more. And we can see that just in these past few years. And um, especially it was really highlighted this past summer with the police essentially looking and behaving like the military. Um, so an example for this is um, where I'm based in New York City, the New York Police Department, they have a budget of $6 billion. And that's a larger budget than many militaries of countries around the world. And the former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg once bragged that he had his own army in the NYPD and that it was the seventh biggest army in the world. And this was in 2011 when the NYPD's budget was 4.6 billion. So, um, and they also have their own Navy, they have an office in Israel. So, you know, this is of course a highly, highly militarized police force. And this is increasing violence in both the US and in Palestine, Israel. Um, this also disproportionately harms communities of color in both contexts through dehumanization, control, violence, and the assumption that black people in the US and Palestinians in Palestine, Israel are inherent threats and therefore justified targets of police, of the police and military. Um, another way that our struggles are connected explicitly is through funding. So the US currently gives $3.8 billion to the Israeli military each year. And this is a clearly a very significant amount but it's also more than the US gives any other military in the world. 
And since 1948, the U.S. has given over $142 billion of U.S. taxpayer dollars to the Israeli military. So what this means um, is that the bombs and the weapons used on Palestinians and their homes and their land are often directly from the U.S. And the other way around, it works like that as well, because the weapons in the U uh, that the U.S. uses around the world and on its own population during protests and demonstrations are often first tested on Palestinians. So these issues are very closely linked. And um, you know, these are just a few ways that our struggles are directly connected, but there have been links of solidarity between Palestinians and black people globally, but especially um, black people in the US. So most black revolutionaries came to support Palestine through a lens of decolonization and international solidarity. And they placed our struggle as black Americans in that context as well. So it became easy to view other situations through that lens. So some examples of this, um, in 1959 and 1964, Malcolm X visited Palestine. And he later wrote about how the British helped steal Palestine from Palestinians and how the Palestinian cause is part of a larger anti-imperialist struggle. And a few years later in 1967, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee published a paper in solidarity with Palestine just two months after the 1967 war. And they later published papers in solidarity with South Africans against apartheid there and um, against the US invasion of Vietnam. So black liberation organizations were very intentionally internationalist. And in 1970, Huey Newton, one of the co-founders of the Black Panther Party, issued a statement saying that Israel was created by Western imperialism and is maintained by Western firepower. We support the Palestinians just struggle for liberation 100%. We will go on doing this and we would like for all the progressive people of the world to join our ranks in order to make a world in which all people can live. And that's the end of that quote. So later Huey Newton went on to meet Yasser Arafat who was the chair of the Palestinian Liberation Organization also known as the PLO at that time. And he visited a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. And at one point the Black Panther Party was in daily contact with the PLO. Um, and they also met Palestinian delegates during the first Pan-African Cultural Festival in 1969 in Algeria. And um, the PLO was also inspired by the Black Panther Party by creating a 10 point program um, stating their demands for justice, which was based on the Black Panther Party's 10 point program as well. And Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish also compared racism in the US and Israeli context. So there's definitely been a lot of close links of solidarity throughout the years between Palestinians and Black Americans, and people like James Baldwin, Angela Davis, Muhammad Ali, Mark Lamont Hill, Michelle Alexander, and so many others have voiced their support for Palestinian liberation. Um, all of these people have understood that very deeply that the Black struggle and the Palestinian struggle are both part of a greater struggle for freedom for all oppressed people. And even today, there's many Black liberation organizations that still stand in solidarity with Palestine. Um, the Dream Defenders, which was created as a response to the murder of Trayvon Martin, they organized a delegation to Palestine um, with Black activists from the U.S. in 2015, and they went alongside with the Black Youth, the Black, the Black Youth Project, sorry, 100, and um, activists from Ferguson, Missouri, where Mike Brown was murdered by the police a year before. Um, and Black Lives Matter as an organization and the larger organization, the Movement for Black Lives, um, have both voiced their continued support for Palestinian liberation. So um, this support also is coming from Palestine to the US um, in solidarity with black people. So as a response to the latest wave of police murdering black people in the US and the uprisings that followed that this past summer, Palestinian organizations such as Al Auda and the BDS National Committee released formal statements in support of Black Lives Matter, the Movement for Black Lives and other black led organizations that work toward black liberation. Um, and even you know, black people outside of the US have also supported Palestine in their struggle for liberation. So Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela, they've both voiced um, in the past, they both had voiced their support for Palestine multiple times with Nelson Mandela stating how the freedom of South Africans would be incomplete without the freedom of Palestinians. And in Australia, Aboriginal activists and academics, along with Palestinian Australians, um, have hosted a Black Palestinian solidarity conferences multiple times. And so again, you know, people have been making these very clear international links um, in opposing the evils of colonialism, imperialism, and racism, racism wherever they appear. And this is all just part of re recognizing that true freedom is only possible when we're all free. 
So coming from that background and understanding that history, our movements become just so much stronger when we all stand together. And I always think that the ideal situation is that we can all stand up for each other's struggles and help one another and make a sort of like massive coalition together. But on top of that, standing in solidarity with others can also teach us about our own movements and inspire us to continue the struggle for freedom for all people. So it's, it's even though you know we do it for other people, we don't do it to get something back, but also our movements become strengthened by that too. Um, but I think that above all, we definitely need to care about each other as humans at the basic level. So um, like Huey Newton said, so we can make a world in which all people can live. Thank you.